Hey everyone, Professor G here, and today we're going to be covering laceration repair and suturing. Uh, suturing tends to be everyone's favorite procedure, and so I am really excited to get to share with you a little bit about how to repair lacerations. And this video is intended to kind of be your instructional video and to get you through the steps you need uh, to get to practicing suturing. So this instructional video is going to include the introduction to the procedure. We know that suturing is one of those procedures that we're gonna be able to use in diff multiple different uh, career paths. So if we're in the family practice clinic or in the urgent care clinic, or especially in the emergency department, we're gonna be needing to know how to do suturing uh, effectively. Also surgery, uh, different surgical practices, you're gonna to need to know uh, the proper techniques for suturing. Now the Procedures we're going to go over today are more of the urgent care, family practice, emergency room type suturing. There is more specialized suturing that goes into surgery, uh, but just getting the technique down, getting the hand-eye coordination is really important when we're talking about this type of procedure. Um, we're going to go over the indications, contraindications, some of the complications that can happen with these procedures, and we'll also touch on some pearls and pitfalls. Uh, after this, we'll go into uh, a explanation and modeling of the different instruments that we'll use for the procedure. And lastly, uh, I'll go ahead and do a demo of the procedure and uh, we'll try to follow the rubric as best as possible, uh, talking about getting uh, consent and going through the steps with you and also talking about giving post-care instructions. So the four suturing techniques that we're gonna cover in this video are the bread and butter suture technique, which is the simple interrupted suture. We're also going to be covering the vertical mattress, the horizontal mattress, and the continuous or running cutaneous suture, otherwise known as kind of the baseball stitch. And we'll go one by one uh, through these and talk about the differences and how we would approach the patient. First off, we're going to talk about simple interrupted. Now, in my practice in emergency medicine, I would say 98% of the time I'm doing simple interrupted sutures. And the reason why is because they're really easy, simple to put in, and they hold the skin together really well. And so we're going to go into this a little more. I'll, I would say that the majority of what you will be doing if you're in those kind of settings are simple interrupted sutures. So if you're going to spend a lot of time practicing, I would definitely recommend practicing this one the most. Simple interrupted sutures. So why do we do them? The indications of simple interrupted sutures are really a lot of different things. Uh, superficial wounds and anything we wanna close with just one layer. Also, we always, always, always want to evert the wound edges, meaning we bring them together like this so that the inside of the skin is touching. Uh, never wanna invert the edges. Um, really what we want to do is just bring the two sides together. If we have a cut, we want to bring them together for proper healing and, uh, and minimizing scars. Um, we also, you know, really the indication is to bring two sides of a cut together, right? Uh, closing the wounds in the areas um, of movement, such as the flexor creases or dorsum of fingers. Really, this, uh, interrupted sutures you can use anywhere. You can use them on the face, on the extremities. Uh, anywhere really. And they're very effective means of bringing the skin together. So what are some of the relative contraindications? When we talk about contraindications, we mean like, why shouldn't we? Or why should we think about maybe not? Uh, generally speaking, when we think about laceration repairs, we think about uh, primary healing and secondary healing, right? And we're trying to help this laceration heal as quickly and efficiently as possible. Now, we really only want to put in stitches if the wound is fresh, right? If it's within the first six to eight hours, those are the best times to put in sutures. There are other times when we can put sutures in after that eight hour mark, uh, but we definitely would increase the risk and likelihood of infection at that point. So at that point, you kind of have to make a risk benefit uh, decision. But anyway, uh, a relative contraindication for a simple interrupted suture would be a wounds that are really widely separated and that have a lot of tension on the skin. So these, these stitches, simple interrupted, are not that great by themselves at pulling really stretched apart lacerations together, 
okay? If we have a wound that has been pulled apart really, really far, or that has a lot of tension, we definitely wanna think about either combining a couple different types of sutures or using something that, that can hold more tension on the skin. Uh, other relative contraindications for any type of laceration where we're cutting, poking, uh, any patient, we're definitely going to want to avoid those with severe bleeding disorders. Um, we also want to avoid it if they have some sort of extreme illness that would make wound healing difficult. Um, cellulitis, so anytime you have an infection, you don't want to go poking on it unless we're cutting open an abscess. Indications, uh, uh, conditions that would interfere with wound healing, like collagen vascular diseases, smoking, renal insufficiency, diabetes, all those things that make it harder to heal. Um, there are also some more rare conditions like Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan that can make healing more, more difficult. Um, also, in, if you're on certain medications like aspirin, other NSAIDs or, or warfarin that might increase bleeding. Um, another thing that when we have patients that, when we have patients that we're gonna be poking, cutting, stitching, uh, we definitely want, the uncooperative patient, we have to think about maybe trying something more like glue or steri strips. And when I mention uncooperative patient, when I talk about suturing, we're mainly talking about little kids, right? We know that they are quite uncooperative when it comes to holding still to put stitches in. And so I could do an entire lecture on tips and tricks to keeping kids cooperative, uh, but that's for another time. Um, another thing is if we're in an emergency situation where we're trying to close it as soon as we possibly can, sometimes we can consider running, running the suture rather than cutting after each uh, interrupted suture. So those are the relative contraindications. Some of the complications. So after we're done with the procedure, some of the things that can possibly happen are things that are pretty common sense, right? If we are, if we have a laceration and we're poking and we're trying to close it up, it can bleed. Uh, we can also introduce infection, although we use sterile technique for this procedure. So we really do try to minimize introducing infection and prevent infection. And another thing, it seems common sense, but we should definitely tell our patients that just because we're closing it up doesn't mean you're not going to have a scar. You're, anytime your body has to repair itself, a scar is going to form. But our goal is to minimize scar formation, not prevent it. So some pearls and pitfalls, the more you do it, the better you'll be at it. And that's with any procedure. The more practice you get, the more confident you get, and the better the outcome, right? Um, you definitely want to be gentle. You're using forceps in your left hand, and you're using needle, needle holders in the right hand. And you want to be careful with the tissue. You don't want to grab it. You don't want to be abrasive with the tissue. You want to be gentle. Um, also, you want to be careful. You're using a, a very sharp needle, so you want to be careful uh, to use your instruments appropriately and correctly, and I'll try to show you that in the demonstration so that you put the least amount of risk into the procedure as far as sticking yourself or poking your patient where they don't need to be poked. Um, in general, this is not a hard, fast rule, but uh, sutures should be placed about as far as part as they are wide. So as big of a bite as you take is about how far you should space them. Really, as you practice more, you'll get to know kind of how far apart your stitches should be and, and how, how many you'll need to close. Um, patients love to ask how many stitches you're going to put in me. And I always say as many as it takes to close it because every stitch, every laceration is just a little bit different. Um, Tension on the wound. So we gotta be really careful when wounds are like, let's say on the shin, right? So the shin is kind of a tense area to begin with. And then if we have a laceration with swelling, now we have a lot of tense skin and it can be really challenging to close those type of lacerations. Um, we wanna minimize uh, tension on the skin because the more pressure we put on skin, the more likely we are to strangulate tissue and um, increase scarring and increase uh, delay healing. And so we want to remove um, remove tension on the skin. There's several different techniques we can use. One, we can undermine the under the subcutaneous tissue and kind of pull just the skin portion together. Uh, we can also use tension uh, reducing stitches. So we can use internal stitches and we can also do mattress stitches that help us with that. Um, if there are any gaps you know, once you're done, then you'll want to place additional sutures. And just because you put a stitch in doesn't mean you, you don't, you can't take it out, right? 
the it's not set in stone. So if you put it all together and you notice that there's one little area that can be fixed, you can always cut the stitch out and put it in. That's the beauty of uh, putting anesthesia in the skin is that we can work comfortably and efficiently and we can take our time. Uh, one last thing that I already mentioned, we always, always, always want to keep the skin edges everted, everted, facing upward and towards each other. All right, so that's the simple interrupted. Next, we're going to talk about two mattress stitches. And the first of these is the vertical mattress suture. Vertical mattress suture is also known as the far, far near to near suture. And as you see in the demo, it'll make sense why we refer to it as the far, far near near. Now, when do I use vertical mattress sutures or when should you? Uh, usually we put these in wounds that tend to invert. So anytime you have um, kind of a looser skin or back of the neck, areas that bend a lot, you can actually get inversion of the skin rather than eversion naturally uh, without any tension. And so if we want to on purpose uh, evert the skin, we can use the vertical mattress suture because it naturally uh, tends to invert the skin towards itself. Um, so yeah, and, and again, number two on here says closure of lax skin. So the dorsum of the hand tends to be really loose. And so anytime you have loose skin like that, sometimes it can be hard to evert those edges. So we can use this also, we can use it for anchoring or tension reducing, right? Um, so that's another thing we can do. Contraindications. So skin without enough laxity to close. So if it's really, really taut, you don't want to use a, a suture like this because you could risk pulling it through the skin when you're trying to put the stitch through. Also, breast tissue, we do not want to use any type of these. Anytime you have a laceration of breast tissue, you should always get plastic surgeon involved because the tissue there is particularly sensitive. And so we definitely don't want to use vertical mattress sutures for that. Um, anytime we have a presence of uh, cellulitis, bacteremia, any type of infection, we do not want to stitch it up. Okay. And uncooperative patient is kind of the blanket uh, contraindication for any type of poking, cutting procedure. Complications. So when we're done with the procedure, I mean, anytime we, we put stitches in a patient, we think we're going to improve the scar formation, and we usually do, but sometimes when we put certain stitches in, we can develop what's called railroad tracks or Frankenstein marks, and those are when you can actually see where the stitch was across the wound. So sometimes you can get that with vertical mattress. You can really get it with any type of suture, uh, but you want to just really be careful and instruct your patient uh, on proper uh, suture removal, and that helps prevent those um, railroad tracks. Um, with these type of sutures, because you're taking two bites in the same vertical area of skin, you have to be careful not to pull through the skin, okay? So that's one thing we'll work on when we get to the demonstration. Other things that we said before, the general complications will be bleeding, infection, and scar formation. So some things we can try to prevent and others, you know, we really just can't, right? Pits, pitfalls and pearls. So there's a lot of pitfalls and pearls. I think most of this will kind of go through as we're doing the demonstration. It's really just, I think vertical mattress and horizontal mattress are pretty straightforward. We do want to use kind of a larger needle when we do these procedures because we're going to take a pretty big bite on the far, far uh, bite. So we're going to have to use a, a little bigger needle to get that through there. And um, we'll, we'll talk about the rest of this when we get to the procedure itself. All right, so the counterpart to vertical mattress is the horizontal mattress. And I tend to refer to this one as kind of a do -si do right? Because you're going in a box pattern to, to tie this suture together. Now, the indications for horizontal mattress are similar to vertical mattress. I mean, thin skin, um, skin that is in areas that are prone to inversion, uh, scalp. So these tend to help cinch the wound too. It helps um, with ligating bleeders, right? So that's why it helps in the scalp. The scalp is particularly vascular. And so we do get a lot of bleeding there. Um, closure of web spaces and fingers or toes, those do also tend to invert. And so this helps bring the edges together better. And this is the stitch that we would want to use under high tension. And so I've used this, this suture many times like on the shin chin lacerations, areas that have more tension than, than we would feel comfortable just putting in simple interrupted stitches. Again, contraindications, skin with poor blood flow because we are putting a, 
a box stitch kind of in the same period, in the same portion of skin. So we can tend to restrict some of the blood flow to that area. Um, severe bleeding disorders and of course local infection. We certainly do not want to put stitches in when we think something's infected or starting to be infected. Uh, complications. Again, bleeding scar formation and infection are, are givens. A couple of other ones, suture marks, right? So if we leave these stitches in too long, like we've talked about with vertical mattress, we can cause those Frankenstein or railroad track marks. So we do want to really advise the patient that how important it is to come back and have these stitches removed. Uh, we can also cause some tissue strangulation and wound, wound edge necrosis if we tie it too tightly because a lot of times we're putting these stitches in a high tension area. And so if we pull that stitch tight too tight, we can actually cut off the blood supply to the skin and cause tissue necrosis, which we certainly don't want to do. As far as pearls and pitfalls, uh, they say, this is really hard for me to follow, but they say the distance down from the suture line is half to two thirds of the suture width. When we do the demo, I'll kind of show you how I look at it, uh, but really it's just making a box with the stitch. Um, so the other thing that we mentioned already is just really try not to pull it too tight because we do want it to evert at the edges, but if we pull it too tight, sometimes we can cause tissue necrosis. So don't tie it too tightly, moral of the story. Last but not least, we have the continuous or running cutaneous sutures. And you can see here, it kind of looks like a baseball, right? It looks like a baseball stitch. And that's, it's also referred to as a, a running stitch. Now, in my experience, I, I don't do running stitches that often. Uh, and the reason why is because as you can imagine, it's quick, right? You're not tying off each knot as you're going, you're, you're just running, running, running. But the problem is, is if you miss one throw, or something happens and something happens to your stitch, be it an uncooperative patient or, or, or whatever, uh, you're gonna, I guess, mess up or, or ruin all that time you put into it because if you mess up one throw, the whole thing is, is gone, right? You can't go back and fix it. So you have less control over how the wound approximates. So really the only times I've ever used running continuous um, or continuous uh, stitches is a really straight kind of perfect laceration in a low tension area. And so the one time I can think of is I had a young guy that came in that was climbing a, a fence and the barbed wire actually cut him across his chest. And he had like, it looked like he took a scalpel and cut his chest. It was superficial. And it was super straight. And so I put in a running continuous to save me time. It was really long to save me time and also to, um, you know, to make it nice and beautiful. Was it easy laceration to sew up? Um, other reasons why other people use it, emergency triage, like if you just really got to get this closed and deal with some more life-threatening issues, you can do these running cutaneous. Uh, long wounds, right? So non-facial area long wounds that we talked about. Shallow wounds, right? Something that's just shallow, like, like those lacerations I talked about on the chest. Uh, you can also do it with, with skin grafts uh, if you're in a specialized field. So the relative contraindications are pretty similar to everything, to all the other ones, right? They're pretty similar to the simple interrupted, okay? They're all the same, except the only additional one is patients with the propensity to pick at their wounds. And so if you have a patient that says, you know, I'm not gonna leave it alone, or especially little kids, you wanna be careful using this because if they pick and untie and it comes unraveled, the whole laceration is gonna be unraveled. So I never use running cutaneous on little kids because if it comes undone, then, you know, it took that, it took that effort to get them cooperative enough to put the stitches in and you definitely don't want to have them come out. Some of the complications are the big three, again, bleeding, infection, and scar. Some additional ones are crosshatch scarring when you pull too tightly, uneven wound edges, and that has to do with the way that you take the bites and how tight you pull the wound together. Puckering can be caused also when you don't when you don't line it up evenly and you get kind of a shift and you get kind of a dog ear on one end. So we'll talk about how to approximate the wound so that we don't get this. And then wound dehiscence. So if the suture thread breaks, you're going to get opening of the wound again, like we talked about. And that's not good when your whole purpose was to close the wound. What I'll do, so 
it's talking about how to tie this. So there's a couple different ways to tie uh, a running suture or to throw running suture. And I'll, I'll talk to you about my way to do it and, and the easiest way, I think, to come up with a nice clean uh, laceration repair. We'll go through that in the demonstration. Uh, just like with the other ones, don't tie it too tightly. Don't use it on an uncooperative patient. Don't put it on the face or any other area that tends to, that we wanna prevent scarring. And uh, before you tie that final knot, you wanna make sure that everything comes together nicely, okay? So overall, all the procedures, when we're done doing sutures, at the end of our procedure, we're, want, we're gonna want to explain to our patients uh, what to look for and, and when to return. So we're gonna tell them, don't pick at it, don't break it, don't cut it on your own, right? Just leave it alone, leave it alone. Uh, you wanna keep the wound covered, uh, put some antibiotic ointment or some petroleum-based ointment on the laceration. Uh, now, petroleum-based ointment and antibiotic ointment, we don't wanna use if we're using dermabond or, or skin glue because it can actually loosen the adhesive. So today we're not talking about that, but I just wanted to mention that as well. You can have the patient wash it gently with soap and water. You can pat it dry afterwards and then cover it or dress it if needed. Um, we definitely want to advise our patients not to smoke. This is a good opportunity to do that because uh, smoking can delay wound healing. And we always want to instruct our patients when to return to have their sutures removed. And so the appendix at the back of your text, appendix H, actually tells us when to re remind our patients to come back. And it really just depends mainly the tension, where it's located, um, and the complexity of the laceration. So on the face, generally, I say three to five days. I uh, usually recommend about five, but if it's a tiny laceration, the quicker you can get those stitches out, the less likelihood you are gonna have of having the little dots in the scar or the railroad tracks. On the neck, generally five to seven days. I don't see very many neck lacerations, but you know, it can happen. The scalp, we see lots of scalp lacerations. Generally for scalp lacerations, we use staples, which we're not gonna cover today, but just keep that in mind. On the trunk, 10 to 14 days. On the upper limb, 10 to 14 days, especially the longer if we're on a joint surface, right? Because the more bending, the, the longer it takes for things to heal. And then uh, palms or soles, like, like those are thicker skin, so it takes a little longer, 14 to 21 days. And on the lower limb, there's a pretty wide gap, two weeks to 28 days, depending on where it is, how deep it is. Uh, and you can always have them come back in about two weeks, have you look at the wound, see if it's ready to have the stitches out. But at that point, especially on the leg, we're less concerned about a scar, we're more uh, invested in making sure that it's healing appropriately. And you know, that's about all I have for right now. Next, we're gonna go into showing you the different tools that we have and what we use to close up the laceration, and then we'll go ahead and do a demo. All right, now we're gonna talk about the different equipment that we're gonna be using to do our laceration repair. Uh, first, anytime you're gonna be doing a laceration repair, you wanna make sure that you have all of your equipment ready to use by the time you get into the patient room because there's nothing worse than starting a procedure, getting sterile, gloved up, and then realizing, oh, I forgot this or I forgot that. Uh, so make sure that you kind of have a mental checklist of what you need and have it all ready. I usually get one of these Mayo stands and put everything on it uh, before I go back into the patient room. Um, the suture kit that you get in most facilities comes kind of in an all-inclusive little carton. Uh, usually what it has in there are going to be some equipment like this and some drapes. Uh, every laceration tray is a little bit different. Most of the time the extra stuff you're going to need to get before you go in are going to be your sterile gloves. Make sure that you know the size of sterile glove that you are. I'm a six to six and a half so I'll grab those. Some other things that you need is gonna be your suture material. So depending on where you're gonna be placing your stitches, you're gonna to need to find the appropriate suture. When you look on the package or on the box, uh, what you'll look for is the size of the needle. Now this is the actual size of the needle. Then you'll also wanna look at the number of the suture. So this here is a 5-0, so 5-0 suture. When you have the dash O, the higher the number, so 5-0, 6-0, 7-0, those are going to be the smaller 
the, the, the smaller the caliber of the suture material. So if you get up to 7.0, it's basically as fine as your hair. It's super fine. And the reason why we have different um, thicknesses of suture is because when you do something delicate like on the face, you're going to want to use like a 6.0. If you're doing it on the finger, which has a lot of movement, maybe a 4.0. And if you're doing it on the shin, maybe even a 2.0, right? Because it just really depends how much tension you have on the laceration. And usually the, the needles are kind of corresponding with that. So they get bigger or smaller depending on where you're going to be doing the laceration. So you'll want to grab one of those and the packet looks kind of like this. And it's sealed up and sterile on the inside. Uh, you'll also want to grab some triple antibiotic ointment. Usually it does not come in here. The nurse usually has to get it out of the facility and maybe like a little Q-tip or, or applicator. Uh, usually get a pack of 4x4 four four gauze and it usually comes like in a little pack in a little basin and I get usually some betadine like a little jar of betadine if the patient is not allergic. Other thing we'll need is we're going to need to ask our nurse to get us some um, some lidocaine or marcaine with or without epinephrine depending on where we're going to be doing the laceration repair and you'll need some needles usually so a drawing needle which is um, usually this red blunt tip uh, needle that's just for drawing up medication. And then you'll need another needle. Now the smaller the caliber of needle, this one's a 30 gauge, so it's really, really small. The smaller the caliber of the needle, the less it burns the patient because if any of us have ever had laceration repair, we know that lidocaine burns. And so to help minimize burning, try to use a smaller gauge needle to help put that medicine in. Um, you'll, sometimes I'll use a band-aid. Most of the time I'll just put some gauze on it afterwards. Um, on the wall in the room, you'll have your basic gloves and uh, your tools. Once you open up your kit, you're going to have a needle driver. The needle driver, um, you're going to be putting your, your, your thumb and your fourth finger in the holes and your index finger goes on top to help guide. And you don't want to put the fingers all the way through the holes and hold it like that. You want to hold just the tips and it's always going to be one and four that go in the holes like that. Okay. If you can buy a small suture set on Amazon, it's really good to get familiar with your tools. The better you can open and close these little locks, the, the more dexterous you're going to be when you're putting the suture in. Uh, it also is going to come with some forceps. Usually laceration trays come with rat tooth forceps. They have little teeth on the end to help grip the skin. Just be sure that you're gentle with that because you can actually tear the skin if you're pulling too hard with your non-dominant hand. Now when I hold my forceps, because my needle driver is going to be in my dominant hand, my non-dominant hand is going to hold them and we call it pencil grip. Uh, meaning that if I was going to write my name, I would be holding it like this. The top part of the instrument is going to go above my finger, not below, because I think of this as kind of like a messy eater, right? But this is proper. So you hold it like this and that helps you grip. And last, we have some scissors. Usually your kit will come with scissors and you'll hold them exactly the same way that you hold your needle driver. Now, a quick tip. If you're not that great with your non-dominant hand, my suggestion to you is to find some little things around your house that you can do to try to develop some ambidexterity, right? So uh, eat with your left hand, brush your teeth with your left hand. You'd be surprised how, be how much better you can do these fine motor skills when you develop those, uh, those skills at home doing those little things around the house. Uh, so I think we have everything we need to get started. Uh, next, I'll start the demo. All right, now we're gonna do a demo of the simple interrupted suture. So for this demo, I'm gonna start at the very beginning of your rubric and get all the way to the end of your rubric, going step by step. Uh, for the other sutures, vertical mattress, horizontal mattress, and continuous, I'll go ahead and do shorter, more targeted demos of just the technique, okay? So getting started, this, what, where we're getting in this part of the rubric is we've already kind of introduced ourselves and done an exam, but just for completeness sake, we're going to first introduce ourselves. And we're also going to verify our patient's name and date of birth. So it'll sound something like this. Hi, I'm Christina, I'll be your PA for today. And I'd like to go ahead and verify your name and date of birth, okay? Then you'll wanna check on allergies. So you always wanna ask the patient, do you have any allergies to medications? Okay. I usually like to kind of start off the whole encounter with, has, have you ever had any stitches before or has anyone in your family ever had stitches? To kind of gauge their familiarity with the procedure. If they say, no, I've never seen it, I'm really scared, I want to know what's going on, I'll be more informative. If they say, oh yeah, I've had tons of them, then I can be a little bit more lax on my education. 
Um, I also want to ask the patient if they've ever had a tetanus shot. This is not like ever in their life. You want to know within the last five to 10 years, have you had a tetanus uh, booster? After you get that information, you'll want to discuss the procedure and acquire informed consent. So with this, uh, anytime you have a laceration, the first thing you want to determine is what is the indication? Why do we need to close it up at all? And in most cases, it's because you have a cut, right? <laughs> and um, the most common places to have lacerations are going to be on the fingers because we use our hands for everything and on the face. But it doesn't matter where it is. That's the indication. You have a cut. We need to help you close it up. Uh, the risks and benefits are the next thing we want to talk to our patient about. When we talk about risks and benefits, we want to talk about the reasons why we maybe might not want to and the reasons why we really do want to. And in this case, there's really not too many risks associated with laceration repair. The main one that I can think of is just the timing of it. So we want a fresh laceration. We certainly don't want to uh, close up a wound that's been there for a longer period of time. Usually about eight hours is kind of the, the lax cutoff for it. So anything before eight hours, anything that they've come in for quickly, uh, I will tell them, you know, they're really not a whole lot of risks. Um, the benefits of it are we're gonna help, hopefully, with scar formation. We're gonna help minimize infection and, and um, help close it up so it doesn't bleed, right? If it's still bleeding, those would be the risks and benefits. The alternative treatment options, if it's on the face or on an area where I can use adhesive like uh, Dermabond, then I will discuss at this time the differences between the two. And I usually give my recommendation, uh, although it is their decision to make, they don't have the same training that we do. So we wanna tell them what we would recommend, kind of like if it were our kid, what we would recommend. Um, other things could be staples or not sewing it up at all, right? Uh, complications. So complications for any type of these uh, procedures are going to be mainly three things. One is bleeding. Well, it's probably already bleeding, but we're going to try to help that. When we poke something, it might bleed more. Okay, so that's one of the uh, complications. Uh, then there is uh, infection. So we're going to be using sterile techniques. So we shouldn't induce an infection, but there is always a risk of infection after a procedure like this. And lastly, there is the risk of scar formation, right? Uh, the thing about it is we're human. So anytime we have a cut in our skin, our body regenerates, but it's never the same way it was before. So you definitely want to be honest with your patient. Uh, we're not miracle workers. We're just going to help help minimize scar formation, but that is a complication. The scar is a complication. Last is uh, the risk of refusing the procedure. So anytime you're going to be doing a procedure on the patient, it is ultimately their decision whether or not they want to proceed. And so the last thing you want to say is if they come out and tell you, you know what, no, I don't want you to sew me up, you'd like to tell them why you think it's important that you do what you're going to do. And usually that's minimizing infection, minimizing scarring, and better healing. Uh, next, uh, I just want to add there, I don't always tell them the risk of refusing unless they refuse. You know, I'm not just going to lay it all out for them. But anyways, uh, we're going to gather our supplies. So the, it's important to have your patient in a comfortable position depending on where their laceration is. Get the patient comfortable because they're going to be sitting still for a while and get yourself comfortable. You definitely don't want to be bending over, moving, twisting. You want to be in a nice comfortable position to proceed with the procedure. After we gathered up all our supplies that we already talked about uh, a little earlier, um, the first thing we want to do is kind of prepare our sterile field. So the first thing we'll do is we'll open up our little laceration tray in sterile form, open it up, and then we'll get our suture, which is in a nice little packet like this. This one's already been opened, but we'll open that up in a sterile fashion, and we'll dump our suture on our sterile field without touching anything. Okay, and we'll toss that. I usually keep a trash can right by my feet so I can dump all my trash. Then I'm going to verbalize washing hands. So I'm just going to wash my hands, okay? And I'm going to put on my non-sterile gloves. These are the ones you get off the wall in the room usually. So I'll put those on. All right, next we're going to cleanse the wound and prep it for local anesthetic. So usually, like I said, I'll have a little bin of four by fours. I'll get my betadine and I'll, sque I'll squeeze some in here so there's betadine on these gauze and then I'll grab one by one and I will clean the wound. Now, warn your patient, it might sting a bit because they do have an open wound and betadine does burn a little. You can also use chloroprep depending on what facility uh, you're working at. So I'll clean the wound, toss it. I usually do about three of these, so clean. Toss, 
clean toss. Okay. Then we're going to go ahead and drop our, our uh, anesthetic. So like I said, usually you have a drawing needle. We'll open it up. We'll put it on our syringe. I usually use about a 10, 5 to 10 cc syringe. Always get more than you need because you never want to go back and have to refill it, okay? Even if you don't use it all. What you then do is draw up however much air you're going to be filling it up with liquid. And on these, if it's brand new, you'll pop the top off and it's ready to go, sterile. If it's used, you'll want to clean it off with an alcohol prep pad first. So then you'll get this, you'll in, insert the needle, and then you'll, in, you'll inject the air into the, into the, the um, medicine, and you'll withdraw the medicine. I don't want to suck up any liquid in here because I don't want to inject liquid in mine, but that's how you would do it. Then you kind of get the bubbles out of here and make sure that there's no air in there, okay? Now, when you put the top back on, they always say not to recap a needle if you can uh, avoid it. I've been stuck before, and so it's not a fun process to go through the needle stick. So if you can avoid it, don't recap it just like that. If you absolutely have to, you can kind of fish for the cap, pull it on, and snap it. Now, this goes in with the rest of my sharps. I'm not just going to throw it in the trash. Then I'll put on my injecting needle. Like I said before, I like to use the smallest caliber needle possible. Okay, this is a 30. So I have my anesthetic nice and drawn up and put it right here. Let's see what else we need. Everything good. I'll usually grab a piece of gauze. I'm going to use this, have it in my hand. And this is nice and cleansed with some betadine. So now I can do my local block. So let's just pretend that the laceration is over here on this side. What I usually do is I'll start on one corner of the laceration and I warn the patient it's going to feel a little sting and some burning. I go in, usually in the hole that's already been created by the laceration, and I go in as far as the needle can go. I withdraw to make sure I'm not in a vessel, and then as I'm pulling the needle out along the edge of the laceration, I inject medication. Okay? Then I re-angle my needle to the other side of the laceration, withdraw to make sure I'm not in a vessel, and inject, inject, inject as I'm pulling out. Now, lidocaine works pretty quickly. Probably within 30 seconds, you're going to feel some of the effects. And so the benefit of doing the anesthesia this way is half of the laceration is already numb. So now I can go where I've already numbed. The poke shouldn't hurt anymore. Go in and do the same thing along the, the second half of the laceration. Going on this side. Withdraw, push. And that should be nice and numb. It doesn't take much on a simple laceration. Remember, do as I say, not as I do. I'm going to recap my needle. And I'm going to let that medicine work. Now, according to our rubric, it says it takes about five minutes. I mean, usually it takes about 30 seconds to a minute to really take effect. But while I'm preparing everything else, I'm going to let that sit for a bit while I'm getting my other things. So the basin that I had the gauze in, I'll probably fill it up with some normal saline and I'll get a syringe. I'll suck up some of the normal saline and I'll irrigate my wound. So that's the next step. I'll kind of spread it apart a bit and stick my, my thing here covering it up with some gauze because I don't want it to splash up in my face and I irrigate it. Another tip to use is uh, a lot of times in the ER you have these big normal saline bottles and so what they'll do is they'll actually get the bottle, it's a lot bigger than this, but they'll put some holes with an 18 gauge on the top of it and then they can use that to use like a shower on our laceration which works really well, especially if it's a dirty wound. At that time, it's also a good idea to look for any foreign bodies. Really depends how you got the laceration. I mean, if you cut it with a kitchen knife, more than likely it's not going to have any uh, foreign bodies in there. If you fell on, a gra on gravel and have a laceration, you're going to need to do a better exploration for any type of uh, foreign body. All right, we got that. We're ready to go. Uh, I probably at this point will check my laceration. I'll say, hey, can you feel this? Any sharper pokey? Now, remember, lidocaine doesn't, doesn't uh, dull touch. So they can still feel touch, but they shouldn't feel pain. And so I always, I always distinguish that when I ask my patient if they can feel it. All right, so I'm going to take off my non-sterile gloves, throw them in my trash can right here at bedside, and get my sterile gloves. Now, we will be doing a separate demonstration video on how to don sterile gloves. So at this time, I'll just say that I put on my sterile gloves. All right, next we're gonna drape the wound. So I have my sterile gloves on. This is my sterile 
uh, packet with all of my materials. And so the first thing that's usually on top is going to be just a, a drape. And so with this drape, you want to hold and open it away from you because you don't want to touch anything that's not sterile. Now, and this is the one that I usually slide up underneath the patient's limb or under their head or lay it across their chest if it's in their face. And that's so that I have extra space to work with because all of this is sterile. In this case, I'm going to pick up my patient and put them on top of my sterile drape. So now I can use all of this area to work with if I need it. Next is going to be usually a fenestrated drape and I have it over here. But you're going to pull that out in the same way, kind of step back and away from it. There'll be a hole in it and you'll want to cover up everything but the laceration that you're going to be working with. This is nice and sterile. Then you can grab your tools, whatever tools they are, and your suture and you can actually set it on top of your sterile field to work. For this demo, I'm gonna go ahead and take this out so that we can see what we're doing better. But I will set these here, and I have some other suture that I'm gonna be using here. All right, so now we're ready for the actual suturing part. This is the fun part. So we'll grip our needle drivers like we talked about with fourth and first finger, and I'll grab my needle. So my needle here, you'll see the thread comes in into the curvy needle. The place where the thread goes into the needle is rounded and we don't want to hold the needle with the rounded part because it'll spin on our needle driver. So if they say about two thirds, so I usually go about right there and you just want to grab it with the tip of the needle driver. You don't want to grab it deep like that, just the tip, okay? I usually do about two clicks on my needle driver and I grab my forceps. Remember holding it like a pencil. Next, we're gonna go ahead and pick up the skin on one side of the laceration, and we're going to insert the needle at about a 90 degree angle. Now, these needles are rounded, so you're gonna to wanna to twist your wrist to help push it through. And we're going to take a bite on each side of the laceration while we're practicing. Once it goes through the skin, I'm gonna grab it again and twist my wrist over, and now it's completely through one side. Then what I'm gonna do is reload my needle now I continue to hold on to my forceps. If you need to, you can put them down in between each throw. And I grab my skin here. Now, your non-dominant hand is actually pretty important. How you hold the skin and move it helps you visualize the laceration that you're repairing. So next I'm gonna grab this, I'm gonna put it through, push it with a turn of my wrist, let go and grab it, finish turning it. Now I'll set my forceps down. I'm gonna pull the, the thread through Far. Be careful. You don't want to pull it all the way through, then you got to start all over. But I leave a little bit of a tail so that I can start my knot tying. These are called instrument ties. The first one you'll always do is a surgeon's knot. And what that basically means is I'm going to wrap over my instrument twice. And then I'm going to grab the tip of my suture and I'm going to pull this down and it's going to lay nice and flat across my laceration. Be sure not to pull it too tight. Now, the next step, we're gonna go the opposite direction. So the first one, I wrap forward twice. Now I'm gonna wrap backwards once and find my tip. Now in this part, it's really important not to pull up here. You wanna just lay it down because if you pull up, it's gonna loosen. Once we tie that knot, everything should be nice and tight and we can finish. So forward, backward, and forward one more time, and that should be a total of five knots that we've tied. Now I'm gonna move the knot over to the side of the laceration. So you don't want the knot to be in the middle, it'll irritate the cut. And then we can cut our tails. So it's always important to leave a little tail. If it's a large laceration or large suture material, I leave a longer tail. For the smaller ones, I can leave a smaller tail. And those are to assist when removing the stitch, and also if the knot starts loosening, it won't come completely out and unravel. For the purposes of this demo, I'm going to do one more uh, suture, but for your practical, you'll need to do four of these. Okay, so I'll grab the skin, insert the needle, turn it, let go, grab it again, pull it through, reload, grab the skin, come through. Make sure when you uh, grab the needle to pull it through, don't grab the tip, you'll dull the needle. Pull that through, have a little tail here. Grab it, wrap it, grab the tip. If you grab too far down, sometimes it'll get folded up in your knot, so try to grab the tip right here. Lay it down, surgeon's knot. 
coming backward now, laying that down, forward, backward, and forward one more time. Move the knot to the side, cut it, leaving it little tails. All right. Now, I think we're about done. Let's just pretend that we finished all four of our stitches. Now that we've closed it up, we're ready to kind of clean up our area. So the first thing you'll want to do is kind of get some gauze, uh, get some normal saline, and kind of wipe off some of that betadine or the prep, whatever you prep the wound with, because it can get itchy for the patient. So you'll wipe all that down, throw that away. Uh, you'll get some triple antibiotic ointment. You can put it on a little cotton tip applicator and place it on the wound. And you'll probably want to dress the wound so you can either put some gauze on there with some tape or you can get a band-aid and put it on there. Uh, I always try to cover it on their way out. Uh, last, we're going to um, go ahead and try to discard of all of our materials. Uh, we want to make sure that we keep track of all our sharps. If it's a long cut and we've used like two or three of these, we want to keep all of the needles accounted for so we can dispose of them in the sharps container. So we'll do that. Throw all of our sharps in the sharps container. Uh, a lot of times the actual tools are disposable too, so just make sure before you start that you know whether they are or they're not. And throw those in the sharps as well. Um, last, we're going to uh, wash our hands again, and then we're going to explain the post-procedure care instructions. Now, we talked about the post-procedure care instructions a little bit in our intro portion of this video, but basically what we're going to tell our patient is that we want to keep this area nice and clean, okay? You can wash it gently with soap and water, but you're going to want to keep it dry, pat it dry afterwards. We also usually don't recommend submersing it underwater, so no swimming, no baths. Um, after that, you're going to recommend that they look out for signs of infection. And not all patients know what to look for, so you want to be really descriptive. You want to say any redness, swelling, drainage of pus, any pain out of proportion, um, or if the stitches start coming out, coming undone. You'll also tell them, don't mess with the stitches. Don't pick with them, don't play with them, and certainly don't cut them out yourselves. Uh, after that, you get it all, all taken care of. And, and you'll tell the patient also that they need to come back to have them removed, especially if they are non-absorbable. And like we talked about in our intro video, uh, depending on where the laceration is and, and whether it has a lot of tension, that will determine when they need to come back. And it's super important that we inform our patient of this and document it because half of it is us doing a good job uh, uh, sewing up this laceration, but the other half is them coming back. We certainly don't want them to get any railroad tracks or any increased scarring uh, because that's kind of what we're trying to prevent to begin with. Um, always ask the patient if they have any questions after you're done. And um, you can even use the teach back method where you have them kind of talk back and explain what you explain to them. Um, so that's about it for the simple interrupted. We went from start all the way to finish. Next, what we'll do is just some shorter videos on the technique of the vertical mattress suture, the horizontal mattress, and the continuous suture. Okay, so now we're going to do a vertical mattress stitch. Vertical mattress is far, far near, near in a straight line. So this is our simple interrupted stitch, so we can kind of compare. I'm going to grab a bite right here. We're going to go just outside of the black line black dot, excuse me, and we're going to push through. This is just like we would do an interrupted stitch, but a little wider. Load it up the same way, and then we're going to come through just outside of the black dot. So that's our far, far. Now we're going to reverse load, and when we reverse load, usually we load it like this, we literally just flip the needle upside down and load it. Then we're going to go near on the same side, just a little inside of the dot. Go near, reload, and then reload here. We gotta be careful not to pull our, our end through. So reload this way. Near, and pull that through. I'm gonna see it kind of pucker a little bit. That's okay. Surgeon's not. Grab the tip, lay it down. Like I said, you want to kind of see the edges evert just a little bit. Grab 
grab this. I'm going to go the opposite way. Grab the tip. Lay it down. And then just finish out the knot tying. Inside. Oh, I can't see. I need some bifocals. <laughs> And then that's your vertical mattress, so I'll cut. Careful with our needle. Cut this. Vertical mattress. So here we have simple interrupted vertical mattress. Now we're going to do horizontal mattress. Horizontal mattress is like a box stitch. So we'll start here. We'll do a throw like this, just like simple interrupted. And then reload it. Come through just like a simple interrupted stitch. Then when we get to this side, we're going to reverse load the needle. So we just kind of flip it upside down, load it. And then we're going to go on the same side in a box, kind of come back going the opposite direction. Uh, and we need to load it backwards again. Okay. And then come up this way. And go through. So now we have a box pattern. One, two, three, four. We're going to pull this through till we have just a little tail. We're going to wrap it like a surgeon's knot. Lay that down. And then when we do that, you'll see the kind of edges evert a little bit, which is what we want. We're going to then finish the knot. And then just complete the series of knot tying. Can't even see. I really do need five focus. <laughs> Uh, and then finish the knot tying and then cut it. You leave little, little pigtails and then like if I pulled this in a little too much, I'll go and kind of fix the edges a little bit just so they evert nicely. And there you go, vertical horizontal mattress. All right, so now we're gonna do a continuous or running stitch. We have our simple interrupted, our vertical mattress, and now we're gonna do a continuous stitch. So I'm gonna start right here, and I'm gonna throw a stitch just like I would a simple interrupted. Reload. Grab this. Okay, now I'm gonna tie it off. I usually leave my forceps in my hand to just save time, but you can set them down while you're not tying. Okay, I'll set them down just for... Okay, there we go. We're doing our surgeon's knot and then laying it flat. So then we'll finish out our knot tying, but we're not gonna cut it at the end, right? Because we wanna keep it going. Okay, one more. All right, so we're gonna leave it like that. We're not gonna cut it. And now we're gonna go ahead and go underneath to kind of hide our, hide our knot so that we can have our stitches running parallel to each other. So when we go in on this one, we're gonna go in right next to, this, to the knot, not cutting it, but just right next to it. And we're gonna come through in the middle, okay? So we're gonna lay that nice and flat. It kind of disappears, okay? Then we're gonna Reload, and we're coming diagonally to the next dot from underneath. So we're gonna grab here, we're gonna come back underneath here, and we're gonna pop through on that side. So there we go, it's, it's diagonal underneath the skin so that it can be parallel on top of the skin. It just looks a lot cleaner. So I'm gonna grab right here, take a bite, and grab this, and just kind of lay it down like that. Coming out diagonal. Kind of lay, make sure that everything's laying flat as I go. This one goes across. Just making sure it kind of lays flat. Now I'm in the middle, gonna finish this one. Remember I'm coming out diagonally, so I'm coming to the next dot. When you don't have the dots, you kind of have to lay it out. I'll show you how I do it right now. So if I don't have the dot there, I'm gonna kind of lay it across to see, okay, I know kind of ballpark where I'm going. So 
So I'll come through here. Finish that. And on this one, I'm gonna leave a little loop. This is my last, my last one, but I can't finish in the middle. I have to come out on the other side. So on this last one, I'm gonna come out closer right here just so it looks neater. So on this one, I'm gonna come through. I'm gonna come out about right there. I'm gonna pull it through. And right here, I'm gonna kind of make sure everything is nice and tight. Set this down. And I'm gonna do a surgeon's knot using this. I'm gonna pull it as tight as I need to so it's not too tight, not too loose. And then I'm gonna close off the knot like that. And then finish tying them. Okay, and once I got that, then I'm gonna cut my ends. I'll probably cut this one first. And then cut the three here. And there you go. That's four throws, that's how many you need.